when they were in exile. They longed to go home. But God said, you have to wait. But the good news is that God doesn't leave us. God is always present with us each step of the way. So let us worship our Lord today, knowing that God is with us as we give him thanks, praise, and honor. We began this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us rise together as we join our voices in singing. Let the praises ring. What a great morning to praise our Lord. You may be seated. Today, Pastor John will be using Jeremiah 29 as the basis for his message. In it, we hear about the Israelites being in exile and how they long to be at home. But God told them they would have to wait 70 years. Life doesn't stop. It keeps going on, knowing that God is still there with us. I invite you now to hear the word of our Lord in a dramatic reading. Jeremiah 29. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
This was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans, had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Like their lives were unraveled. Having to perhaps wait and trusting in God's promises. Maybe in our lives we can feel like our faith is unstable perhaps or our world has been rocked, but God reminds us in our gospel reading today that when our faith is built on a firm foundation, we can stand strong in Him. Our gospel reading this morning from Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great clash. This is the gospel of our Lord. We praise God for the amazing grace that he has given us, that firm foundation that helps us stand during the storms of life. It's an amazing grace that we have with God, a grace that just flows down to us. We join our voices together now as we sing, Grace Flows Down.
And we certainly praise God that his amazing grace covers us. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he invites us to come and to share our sins with him. And we do so as we confess, knowing that that grace will certainly cover us. That Jesus has taken on the penalty of all of our sins and they'll be forgiven. So let us now turn to God and confess our sins. Lord, we confess to you our sinful brokenness. Rather than live for you, we have lived for ourselves. We have ignored the needs of those around us and focused only on ourselves, selfish. Forgive us for the way we have sinned against you and one another. Restore us by your spirit so that we may live lives that give you glory. Amen. God sent Jesus to take upon himself your sins through his death on the cross. Go in the peace and joy as forgiven, as a forgiven child of God. Amen. It is in Christ alone that we have this living hope. A hope that is secure, a hope that is filled with God's promises. Let us rise together now, praising God for that living hope that we have. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one you set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then 
came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours Father, we just thank you that you are our living hope through Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you that death doesn't have a grip on us. We know that we have that promise, that hope of eternal life, Lord, with you. Thank you for the amazing grace that you have given us for the mercy that you've lavished on us. Lord, as we live our lives. May we just continue to allow Jesus to shine through us so that others may see the goodness that you have, the love that you have for each one of us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather together and worship our Lord, we speak the words together of the Apostles' Creed, the faith that we have in our Father, our Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Let us join our voices together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite our children to Faith Roots, an opportunity for them to hear the message of Jesus in their own setting. And so if we have guests with children, they'll meet right over here at the door. Uh, they'll gather together through the rest of the service, and you can uh, meet up with them following this morning. In our worship today, we take time to offer God our gift of thanks and praise, not only in our talents and the time that we give, but also uh, in the blessings that he gives us financially. We return to God and give thanks. And we pray and give thanks for that, for the many opportunities we have to continue our ministries here at Timothy. I would remind you as well, if you have a prayer you would like to include this morning, now is the time to do that. If you'll have that written on the communication card as I walk through the aisles, just hold them up and I'll gather them from you. Let us now continue in our worship to the Lord as we offer our gift of thanks to him.
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. such an amazing thing that God's love never runs out. It never fails on us. And so we appreciate the opportunities that we have to go to our Lord in prayer, sharing with him our joys, as well as our concerns and even our struggles. This morning in our prayers, we want to include a prayer for a co-worker's son who is 
having uh, tubes placed in his ear, and so we certainly want to pray for God's hand of healing upon this young boy. Also for a two-year-old who fell and is suffering from uh, head trauma. And so we pray that God would certainly intervene and also give uh, strength and comfort to the parents as they go through this. And also we want to pray for Colton Brown, our young 10-year-old who is with us today as he uh, will be preparing for heart surgery on November 2nd. And so we God works, pray that God works mightily in his heart, literally. And also pray for comfort and peace to uh, the family members too, as I'm sure this too will be a uh, struggle in a difficult time as well. And so we pray that God just surround them all. This morning after each prayer, I will say the words, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Let us rise together as we pray. Lord, as we dream about the future, both for ourselves and those we love, keep us grounded in you. Help us to trust you with our future, knowing that you are the one who calls us ahead to places that we can't see and paths we can't plan for. Fill us with faith and assurance that you are with us every step of the way so that when our dreams don't unfold exactly as we hoped, we can rest securely in your grace, trusting that you are still in control. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. And Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are struggling, suffering with illnesses of any kind. Lord, we pray for a successful surgery for this young boy who will be getting tubes in his ears. And Lord, be with this two-year-old who fell and that is struggling and suffering with his head trauma. Lord, be with Colton and his family as he prepares for his heart surgery. May it be your will, Lord, that you would bring healing and recovery to them all. Lord, be with those who are struggling during difficult times. And according to your good and gracious will, Lord, grant them what they need to help and relieve what they're going through. And Lord, we also thank you for the many ways that you bless us every day. And Lord, especially today as we get to gather together for our potluck. May it be a blessing to those as during such a hard time, we still have the opportunities to be together and build relationships. Lord, help us to recognize how you, Lord, are at work in our lives in every situation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. And we thank you, Lord, for the men and women who serve our congregation in, lead, in any leadership capacity on our executive board, our elected elders, and our commissions, the school board. Lord, we pray that you would grant them wisdom and discerning hearts. Help us to recognize, Lord, the opportunities for service that you bring to our congregation, our family. Lead us all to see the path you have chosen for us as a church so that all we do brings glory and honor to you. Lord, in your mercy, for Jesus' sake. Lord, we entrust every part of our lives to you. We have seen over the past few weeks how easy it is for our lives to be unraveled in unexpected ways. We pray that you would help us to trust in you and your grace because we know that your mercy is new every morning and will never fail us. May every moment of our lives be filled with your presence so that we may live out our faith and give you glory with our thoughts, our words, and our actions, and our attitudes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Lord, all, we, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, things that are heavy on our hearts, Lord, we entrust to you, knowing that you not only hear our prayers, but answer them according to your good and your gracious will. Lord, we pray that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us what it means to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hope is securely rested in all that Christ has done. And he invites us now to call upon him. We join our voices together as we sing.
Praise God, he's broken every chain. Amen? You may be seated. Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, there's a question that people ask me from time to time, maybe in a Bible study or as we're talking about different things, usually in confirmation. And that question is this, Pastor, what is your favorite Bible verse? I hate it when people ask me this question for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, as my wife will gladly tell you, I am a horrific fence sitter. I hate making choices. I hate making decisions. And so when somebody puts me on the spot and says, what is your favorite verse? I don't like to get pinned down like that. And so I hem and haw and all that kind of stuff. And besides, the other thing is this. You know, there are so many good verses that speak to me in different ways depending upon what it is I'm going through. So sometimes one verse will be my favorite because it's just resonating with me in that time and place. But then a week later, I'm going through something different, and so a different verse will become my favorite. So usually, when people ask me about favorite verses, I usually list off about 15. And say, so here are my top 15. They, they rotate, move back and forth, just depends upon how I'm feeling. Now, as much as I don't like this question, there is a flip side to this question, right? And what's that flip side? What's your least favorite, right? And okay, as a pastor, I have to say, I don't have any least favorites at all because it's God's word, right? It's all good. It's God-breathed, suitable for correcting, rebuking, teaching, instructing, guiding, training, all of that. So how can a pastor ever have a least favorite Bible verse, right? Well, that's a lie. Because there are times when I'm not too happy with a Bible verse, when it might be considered my least favorite. Usually the reason why is because it's kind of poking at my conscience. I've been doing something that I know I'm not supposed to, and I read a Bible verse and it just starts needling me a little bit and saying, come on, you know how you screwed up. And I say, yeah, shut up. Right? But sometimes, i got to be honest, I do have some least favorites, and I want to explain why they are my least favorites. It's not because I don't like what the verse is saying. I don't like what people think the verse is saying. The problem with these verses is that people too easily pull them out of their context and make them say things that they were never meant to say at all. As a matter of fact, we talked about one of these least favorite several weeks ago. Maybe you remember which one it is I'm talking about. Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do people treat this verse? What do they think it's saying? I can do anything as long as I stick with Jesus. Right? We especially saw this this summer with the Olympics. How were you able to run the marathon in record time? I can do all things. Well, Christ isn't talking about the Olympics or anything like that. You put it back in its context, you read the whole chapter, you realize that's not what God is saying. See, that's why these verses become my least favorite. Not because the verse themselves are bad, but because of the way people use the verse. Now, why am I setting this up like this? Because I'm about to reveal my least favorite verse. The one that always makes me wince and grit my teeth and brace myself for some bad teaching or bad theology. Are you ready? Here you go. You heard it already once? 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Why would I not like this verse, right? How could I possibly ever say that this is my least favorite? Well, because again, the reason why is because nine times out of ten, when we hear this verse, it's been completely ripped out of its context, and people are trying to get it to say something that it never was meant to say. And to understand why, we have to put it back in context. We have to put it back where it belongs. And so you know what that means? It's time for a biblical history lesson. Who's excited? Wow. That is not what I anticipated. Oh, here, okay, here we go. So about 2,500 years ago, the people of Judah, that's the red blob there on the bottom of the screen, were facing something of a crisis, a crisis of their own making. They had been ignoring God's word and God's will for their lives for generations. Rather than live as God's people, as he had called them to be, they had been worshiping other gods, doing whatever they felt like, and they thought they could get away with it. But now God wasn't about to let them just get away with it. He tried to warn them repeatedly. He sent prophet after prophet to them saying the same thing. Guys, you are sinning, and if you don't stop sinning, bad stuff is going to happen. Knock it off or else. And do you know what the people of Judah's response was? La, 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 I can't hear you. And so then what happens? The northern kingdom of Israel gets destroyed for the same reasons. The Assyrian Empire wipes them off the map. And you would think the people of Judah would have said, oh wow, holy cow, that could happen to us. But they don't learn their lesson. They keep on sinning. They keep on doing all of these awful, horrible things. God continues to send prophet after prophet after prophet saying, please stop. Please come back to God. Please repent. Or else, please do it before it's too late. And the people of Judah don't listen. And so finally, finally in 597 B.C., God says enough is enough. And he sends in the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonians march into Judah. They lay waste to the land. They destroy the cities. They capture some of the rich and the elite. We heard a list of names earlier today. Kings and queens and rich people and influential people. And they march them off to the city of Babylon. And once they get there, they put the people of Judah in the city And they say, here's the deal. You have to stay here. It's kind of like house arrest. You can do whatever you want to. Live however you want to. Worship whoever you want to. You just can't leave this city at all. Now the exiles were reeling from this. They were traumatized. They were dumbfounded. How could this ever have happened to them? If you want to get a picture of what they were going through, read Psalm 137. That was written after the Babylonian exile started. And when you read Psalm 137, which by the way, this is going to sound weird. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's on the list. You see the anger The sorrow, the fear, the confusion, it's right there on the page as the people pour out their hearts to God and say, how could this have happened? God, what is going on? And in the midst of that anger and confusion, some prophets show up. Prophets show up in Babylon, and these prophets say to the people who are in exile, these people who have lost their homes, seen family members killed before them, who have lost everything and are now in this foreign land, they say, hey, 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 it's all good. 
It's all okay. Because God is not going to leave us here. As a matter of fact, this is just a speed bump. Before you know it, God is going to send us home. We are going to leave Babylon and return home and everything will be okay again. So don't unpack. Don't go house hunting. Don't settle in. We're going to be out of here. Before you know it, everything is going to be great because God says so. Only God didn't say so. God didn't send those prophets. And so God decides that he has to send the exiles an email. No, that's not right. That would be if it was happening today. Instead, he sends them a letter through the prophet Jeremiah. Now, I feel bad for Jeremiah. He was the last prophet really to speak to the people of Judah before the Babylonians destroyed everything. And because of that, his message was slightly different. All the other prophets up until that point had been telling the people of Judah, please stop sinning or else. Please stop sinning before it's too late. Jeremiah's message was, it's too late. We're done. And sure enough, the, everything gets destroyed. And now God taps Jeremiah on the shoulder and says, I need you to send a message to my people in Babylon. They need to be set right. They need to know what to do. And so what does God say? He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God says you're in Babylon settle in, buy a house, unpack, put down roots, get to know your neighbors, raise families. You're going to be there for a while. And not just that, notice what he says at the end here, this city that you're living in, this prison that you find yourselves in, pray for it. Pray for peace for it. Hope that it prospers because if it prospers, you will prosper. God is saying the exact opposite of what those prophets had been telling the exiles. Oh, and speaking of those prophets, God says this about them. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. God says those prophets who have been telling you everything's going to come up roses, you're going home soon, they have no idea what they're talking about. I'm not the one who sent them. Instead, notice what God says they've been doing. Where did their messages come from? The exiles. They're just telling you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. So what's really going to happen when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my, prom my good promise to bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. How long are they going to be in exile? 70 years. Meaning that some of the people who went into exile would die there. Their children would die there. They would never see their homes again. Someday maybe their grandchildren maybe might be able to go home and see where they came from, but not the people that got this letter. For I know the plans I have for you. Wow. So why is this my least favorite? Well, because think about how people usually use this verse. When do we usually see it? When everything's looking bright and wonderful, right? Somebody graduates from high school. And what do we write in the card? For I know the plans I have for you. Your future is so bright you need sunglasses. Everything is going to be great. 
Why? Because God has good plans for you. A couple gets married. What do we write in the card? For I know the plans I have for you. Your life together is going to be nothing but sunshines and roses and puppy dog kisses. Right? Why? Because God has a good plan for you. It's going to be great. But when we put this verse back in the context where God first said it, were the plans that God had for the exiles all sunshine and roses and puppy dog kisses? No, it was the exact opposite of what they were hoping for. If we were going to use this verse the way that God first used it, we put it in a card that says, congratulations, you've been fired. For I know the plans I have for you. My condolences at the loss of your loved one. For I know the plans that I have for you. See, this is the problem. Far too often, the way we use this verse is we assume that the dreams that we have for our future are the dreams and the plans that God has for our future. And when we hear this verse, we assume that what God is telling us is whatever it is you're dreaming of, it's going to come true because I have good plans for you. And whose plans are good? My plans are good. I have an idea of how things should unfold. I have an idea of how things should be. And because that's a good plan, that's obviously what God wants for me. Because he has a plan for me, one that will prosper me, give me hope and a future. That's got to be what it is. Whatever that dream may be. I have a dream of having a spouse and 2.7 kids. A nice home with the white picket fence and everything. That's got to be what God's going to give me. I have a plan to be independently wealthy so that I can spend my time going on adventure vacations throughout the world. That's got to be what God's going to give me. I have plans to become a TikTok influencer. Even though I'm far too old and have no idea how to get started, it's going to work. Why? Because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, I've got to pull on the other one too. But that's my dream, and that's what God is going to give me. Why? Because that's what my future needs to be. See, that's the problem. We have one idea about what the future is supposed to be, but God may have another dream. And as we try to pursue our dream, we may start to see those dreams unravel. And when those dreams unravel, we can react the same way that the people of Israel did when they were in exile in Babylon. We may grow angry. We may grow resentful. We may rebel against God and say, hey, if you're not going to take care of me, why should I do anything that you want me to do? We may give in to despair and say, what's the point. When our dreams unravel and we start to look at a future that looks a lot scarier than we imagined, we may start to wonder if God has abandoned us or forgotten about us. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Well, hopefully you will be by the end because here's the thing. Even when it feels like God has forsaken us and abandoned us and forgotten about us, we can know with absolute certainty that that is not true. Even when our dreams and expectations unravel, God says, I haven't left you at all. Instead, I'm right there with you in the midst of the unraveling, and I am not going anywhere. I think that's what he was trying to say to the exiles. They were so convinced that their future was over. 
Why? Because they had lost everything. They had lost their land. They had lost their homes. They had lost loved ones. They were desperate for anything that could tell them that their future was going to unfold the way that they wanted it to. And God says, no, that's not how it's going to work. But even as your future goes in an unexpected direction, I have not forgotten you. I am still with you in the midst of this, still at work in your life, bringing about the future for you. This is the way that he put it through a different prophet. In Isaiah 49, he says this, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. At one point, God's people were saying, God has forgotten us. He has forsaken us. He's not there anymore. What's the point of going on? And how does God respond? He says, how could that ever happen? He paints this ridiculous picture of a mother forgetting her children. So I'm going to ask the moms in the congregation today, could you ever forget your kids? Ever? No, of course not. And what does God say? Even if that impossible thing were to come to pass, that doesn't mean that I would forget you. You are carved into the palm of my hands. You are with me everywhere. How could I ever forget you? Now, when I read that last bit about being engraved on the palms of God's hands, I always picture one thing immediately. What pops into my head? This. Jesus' hand. Jesus' hands that bear the nail scars from when he was crucified and died to forgive our sins and make us his people. God's hands are engraved with us because Jesus' hands bear the marks of his grace and forgiveness. What saves us and rescues us from our sin and makes us his people. He cannot forget us. He never will. He never could. It was true for the exiles back then. It's true for us today. Because here's the thing. What God promises us is this, is sometimes you're going to have to walk down roads that you don't want to. Sometimes your dreams are going to unravel in front of you and you will wonder what is going on. But in the midst of all of that, in the middle of it all, I am still there with you. Walking with you, guiding you toward a future, giving you that future and hope and purpose because of my love. That's what he promised the exiles. I mean, this is the thing. Those exiles in Babylon that Jeremiah wrote to, they were in for some rough days. Not just the 70-year exile. Here's the thing. Ten years after those exiles arrived, another batch of exiles from Judah showed up, and they came sharing horrific stories because the Babylonians went back. And when the Babylonian army marched into Judah the second time, they destroyed everything. The city of Jerusalem wiped off the map. The temple that Solomon had built five centuries earlier burned to the ground. Everything that they held sacred and dear was gone. And yet what does God say? Even in the midst of that, you have hope and a future. Even as you live in this foreign city, I have not forgotten you. And he says the same thing to us. Even when our dreams unravel, God says, you can trust me and know that I have not forgotten you. I love you too much to ever do that. I am here with you even now. And to help the exiles understand that, 
to help us when our dreams unravel, I think God gives three pieces of advice, three things we can do when we see our dreams unraveling. This is the first one. He says, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. So the first thing we do when our hopes and our dreams are unraveling is we do what? Pray. But here's the thing to remember. When God says, you can come to me and pray to me and call on me, he isn't just saying, come to me and say the Lord's Prayer and rattle it off from memory. He's not saying be polite and present your requests to me in an orderly and calm fashion. I think what God is saying here is, let me have it. When your dreams are unraveling and you're feeling that fear and that pain and that uncertainty, and yes, even that anger, God says, let me hear it. Let me have it. Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. Let me hear what it is that you are going through. And he promises to what? Listen. He says you're not shouting into a void. You're not doing nothing. You are telling me what is on your heart and mind and sharing that burden with me. I'm a big enough God. I can take it. So the first thing we do is we come to God in prayer. And then God goes on to say this. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. Now this is where the Lutheran in me is coming out a little bit. Because this almost makes it sound like God can get lost, right? Can God ever get lost? No. We're the ones who get lost. We're the ones who lose him. Because what often happens is when things are unraveling is rather than focus on God, we focus on our unraveling dreams. We focus on the pain and the hurt that we feel. We focus so much on this that we lose track of him. And so God says, after you have prayed, turn your eyes from that to me. And look to me and see how I can calm you and give you peace. Sort of like what Jesus said to his disciples the night before he died. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know what, this is one of my favorite Bible verses. Because look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm not promising you a rose garden. I'm not promising you that everything is always going to be exactly the way you want it to be. Will it sometimes? Absolutely it will. But what does God promise us here? One word. Trouble. But even in the midst of the trouble, what does he say? Take heart. I have overcome the world. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he has overcome and defeated this broken world and given us the victory through him. And because he has done that, we now have peace. Peace that the world can't understand. Peace that the world can't touch. That even as things are unraveling, when we turn our eyes to God, when we find him, even in the midst of the brokenness, we can know for certain that God will give us peace. And then finally, number three, God says this. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into into exile. God promises the exiles this will not last forever forever. It's not going to be just a heartbeat and then you're home. It's going to be 70 years, but this is not going to be the way that it always is. And that's good for us to remember too, because when we are lost in our brokenness, when we are feeling like everything is falling apart, don't we often think this is the way it's always going to be? This is it. This is the new normal. And God promises us it won't be. Yes, it might last longer than we like. Yes, it may not wrap up and resolve as quickly as we want it to, but it won't last forever because a day is coming, God promises the exiles, when I will bring you 
home. When I will fulfill that promise and you will see home again. And he makes a similar promise to us. Paul says this in the book of Romans. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul is saying that whatever difficulties and struggles we may be going through, that a day is coming when they will all be put away, when they'll all be ended, when they will be taken off of our plates, when we won't have to worry about them anymore. That glorious day when Jesus returns and sets all things right, when he makes all things new, when he banishes sin and death and sickness and sorrow and tears and shame and suffering and all of it wiped clean from this world. Paul says, whatever it is we're going through, it can't compare to what's to come. It's going to be good. And so when we are feeling like everything is broken and falling apart and our dreams are unraveling, we look from God to that glorious day and we say the day is coming when everything will be made new. And maybe that's a good way to end this series. Because we could probably keep going. We've only done this, what, six weeks? And we know that there are more than six ways that life can unravel, right? We could probably keep going on this for a long time. Wouldn't that be fun, Pastor Rod? Everybody would just love that. What was that? Gloom and doom, doom, nothing but. But next week is LWML Sunday, and I don't think the ladies would appreciate that all that much. But here's the thing, even when life unravels, we can rest assured, just like we heard, that God is still there with us. He encourages us to come to him in prayer. He encourages us to look to him for peace. He says, remember the future that I have promised you. And that will carry us through whatever the unraveling is and bring us through to that future he has promised us, one with hope, one with purpose, one with peace, one with him. But even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You know, it was kind of funny as I was sitting there, I was thinking, all the people that make the millions of dollars on those two verses, Mm -hmm. they will not invite you to be a part of that. No, they will not. I know. That would be a bad marketing director. I was curious. I would like, how many people, though, have something in their home with one of the two verses Pastor John was talking about? I will have a plan and uh, I can do all things. And, and, and you know what? You cool. know what? It's okay because, again, this is the thing. Well, why do I say those are my least favorite? Not because the verses themselves are bad. Those are good verses that have good messages for us. The problem is, is when we misread them and try yeah. to bring those wrong assumptions into them. That's where the problem comes Agreed. from. Agreed. I see it all so, the time, too. Yeah. I don't know. Thanks. As we go out today, just a couple of ministry opportunities to remind you that today we have our potluck dinner. It's at 4.30 today over at the Artie Mize campus in the Family Life Center. So bring a dish and come and fellowship with our other brothers and sisters today. And also, uh, as an opportunity, our collegiate care ministry that we're doing, Pastor uh, Ryan is heading that up. If you have a college student and would like to have a care package sent to him, to them, you can uh, email Pastor Ryan. The email address is up there. It's at ryanh at timothylutheran.com. Just share with him the name and uh, address, and they'll take care of that. If you would like to even send a card or something to our college students, we invite you to do that as well so that we can remind them that their Timothy family is still thinking about them. And then also I wanted to invite you to our upcoming cancer prayer service. It's in two weeks, Sunday, October 24th. This is a wonderful opportunity that we have to gather together to pray, to worship, to encourage and give support to those who are going through cancer at this time, as well as their family and friends. So we praise God, sing 
and pray and we anoint with oil as well as we pray God's blessings upon them. So we invite you to be a part of this. It's open to anyone to attend. So please feel free to share uh, the invite and come and join us for that. As we go out into the world, we uh, face our unraveled lives, our struggles, and we always do it praising our Lord. So let us rise again as we sing once again. Let us sing praises. What is the title? I forgot. Let the praises ring. need to take a moment and invite our elder forward, Charlie, as he just shares a quick announcement with us. He was over there hiding in black. I couldn't see him, so I didn't under- introduce him earlier. Sorry. That's blue. That is not blue. That's blue. All those that say it's black, raise your hand, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Yep. Um, October is National Clergy Appreciation Month, and we at Timothy long ago chose to acknowledge all our called ministry staff with a token of our appreciation. And this year it's a gift card for dinner at the Hereford House restaurant. And for those of you present in this service, as I call your name, please stand to be recognized. And I ask for the congregation to hold any applause until all are recognized. Uh, We'll start with... I'm here. uh, I forgot your name. I forgot yours too, apparently. (laughs) Pastor Rod Lindemann. And... uh, 
Pastor John Otte, who gave us the good news in the, in the sermon just a while ago. And John, I have good news for you. You're no longer the new guy. We now have Pastor Ryan Hulkgrabby, but he's with the kids today, something about doing his job. And, uh, but we do have Nancy Novacheski, our care minister, and two of our called teachers from our elementary school, Jill Otte and Becky Rathke. There she is. I thought I saw you. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give God thanks for, for these his servants. There you go. Turn your mic on. You can say thank you. Do you take your mic off. I took my mic off. Well, then yell. You know, he's a senior guy. He should be doing all that stuff, I think. Well, anyway, thank you. It's certainly a joy and a privilege for all of us. So with that, we say, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the weather before. I think it's supposed to rain, but it looks like the sun's shining. So blessings. <laughs> I know. I didn't see him here. I looked around and I was like, where is he?